Olá pessoal! Hoje, aqui no canal Papo de Pombal vamos explorar a conexão entre nossos amados pombos correio e um dos maiores avanços científicos e filosóficos da história a teoria da evolução das espécies de Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin, renomado por suas contribuições revolucionárias à ciência, utilizou os pombos domésticos como um elemento chave em seus estudos. Em A Origem das Espécies, ele destacou a seleção artificial em pombos, observando suas diversas particularidades, como plumagem, características morfológicas, e o tamanho dos ovos e sua relação com a qualidade dos filhotes. Neste vídeo, vamos mostrar como essas observações de Darwin se conectam com nossa paixão e trabalho com pombos correio. Darwin ficou impressionado com a variedade de cores e padrões nas plumagens dos pombos, um resultado direto da seleção feita por criadores como nós. Ele observou como estas características não ocorriam na natureza, evidenciando o impacto da seleção humana. As variações morfológicas, como o tamanho e a forma do bico, também foram pontos de interesse para Darwin. Ele percebeu como estas características podem ser significativamente alteradas através da seleção ao longo das gerações. A seleção visando ovos maiores e filhotes de melhor qualidade foi outro exemplo claro de seleção artificial que Darwin documentou, ilustrando como características específicas podem ser encorajadas. Nós, columbófilos, seguimos o caminho de Darwin, selecionando características específicas em nossos pombos para corridas de diferentes distâncias. Para voos de longa distância, selecionamos pombos leves, resistentes, com plumagem perfeita e asas bem ventiladas, focando na resistência e eficiência aerodinâmica. Para corridas de curta distância, escolhemos pombos com musculatura desenvolvida, proporcionando uma explosão de velocidade que é crucial para o sucesso nessas competições. Assista agora um documentário sobre os pombos de Darwin e como eles influenciaram na teoria da evolução das espécies. I'm Randall Keynes. I'm a great-great-grandson of Charles Darwin, and I'm here at the building from where the Origin of Species was published just 150 years ago to look at the fancy pigeons that Darwin used at a key point in his arguments for his theory of evolution by natural selection with John Ross, who is a pigeon breeder, judge, and exhibitor who has brought together these six species and can explain them to us. Um, John, can you explain these two first, which are really the most different of all the ones? Yes, I can, Randall. So the English pouter was developed by fanciers around about 1730s from Dutch croppers, which were a pouting pigeon. The fanciers preferred the birds with the bigger crops. Yes. And as the crop was developed Big chest, yes. and the birds were selected for that crop, they were then highly prized and then the breed was developed in that way. You'll also find the legs are longer and they've got feathered legs. So of course the fanciers preferred the breeds to look in this way. Compared to the almond tumbler, which again was developed around about the 1730s. From this, the same ancestor? From the clumber Livia, the rock dove, the humble rock pigeon, the short-faced almond was bred for its very, very short beak. And also the colouring, which is quite a remarkable almond colouring. And this bird was very, very highly prized at the time, times of, of Charles Darwin. So Darwin felt that these two birds and the four others that we'll see show how species can be changed by humans breeding them selectively. And if humans can work changes like this on 
descendants of one bird over just a few generations. It must be possible for nature to develop new species by natural selection. Of course, the breeds we see here today, they have taken many generations to change, but they have changed and man has selected those changes. And uh, to see there may be as many as 250 different types of Columba Livia yes. is quite extraordinary when they've all been developed by man. Uh, just by noticing an odd colored feather or a short beak or a large crop, that man has selected the points that he wanted to develop. And then bred them. And bred and them, bred them. Yes. yes, yes. So what other ones do we have? Well, the other one is the, the barb. It's quite an interesting bird. And this particular bird, this particular bird has a very well-developed eye sear and an extremely short beak, coupled with a wide forehead. And Darwin was surprised that this bird was related to the carrier, albeit they look completely different. But he found that in the embryo development, for the first 24 hours, they were exactly correct. Yes. And it was extraordinary that they, then they diverged after that and the beak developed longer. Again, then, close cousins, the two, yes, the white yes, one Yes, but the diverged one. a long yes. time ago, definitely. The next bird, the Scandaroon, Darwin liked this bird for its extremely long beak. And not only is it extremely long, it's very curved and curved downwards. And you'll also notice that it has a very red eye sear. So again, um, Darwin uh, took measurements from these birds and that was the most extreme that he had. The fantail, which is what everybody would recognize, has this amazing amount of feathers. And in fact, it's in two rows arranged in the back. And again, um, this would have started with maybe a couple of extra tail feathers. And then it would have developed, you know, people would have liked what they saw and developed them from there. And now this bird may have up to 42 tail feathers. The carrier, is the king of pigeons, or was known as that in Darwin's time, and has this very regal, stately look about him. And um, Darwin would have noticed the wattle, which resembled, they say, a large walnut. The wattle uh, being the, the wattle is the bulbous it, it, yeah around the nut around the nostril yes. yeah. One can see, I think, very clearly here one point that Darwin was particularly interested in, and that was that the changes that humans can work by selection in this way affects not only things like the color of the feathers, which one might reckon was easily varied, but in the case of the barb and the scandaroon, the whole shape of the bones of the skull. Of course. Darwin noticed with the uh, English pouter that the vertebra were more numerous and the ribs were wider. So you found that even the skeleton each inside had changed, not just the external characteristics mm. which we see today. And with the barb, the barb has the most extraordinary width to its head, which uh, no other breed appears to have. Yes, yes. The point for Darwin about these six birds, as he explained in The Origin of Species, was that they have all been developed, as we know, from one kind of pigeon, the wild rock pigeon that is common in Europe. And they've all been developed in these extraordinarily different forms over just a few hundred years. What he suggested in this first chapter of The Origin of Species, in which he used these as the best example of just how humans, by breeding, could shape species, and so couldn't nature do it too. What he felt was that these six birds, if they were seen by an expert ornithologist, who was a taxonomist, who was one, an expert in naming different species and arranging them in different genera, the higher categories of kinds of bird, an ornithologist could say, these birds are so different from each other that they must not only be separate species, that bird and that bird, clearly quite different, separate species. He would say also they're so different they, that most of them should be counted as separate genera, that is, kinds of bird rather than particular species. The one with the wide forehead and the short beak, 
the one with the fantail, the one with the extraordinary wattle on its beak, the wonderful pouter with its great chest that it inflates for display, and then the beautiful little almond tumbler with its minute beak. He felt this was the most extreme example of variety from one common ancestor where the breeders had managed to develop birds that could count as specimens of five different genera. And that was his point about how species can change. Assim, nós, criadores de pombos correio, continuamos a tradição de Darwin, aplicando os princípios de seleção para aprimorar nossas aves. Cada escolha que fazemos é um testemunho do poder da seleção artificial e um reflexo do legado deixado por Darwin na compreensão da evolução das espécies.